sorry. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to another day of uh, morning report with CP Solvers. My name is Mario Suito. I'm a post-medical graduate uh, from Lima, Peru, from Caetano Heredia University. And today I have the pleasure of discussing the case with Ravi. And we have a great case being presented by Jimena. Jimena, she's from Guatemala. Jimena, would you like to present yourself? Yeah, thank you, Mario. And thanks uh, to the team of CP Solvers for giving me this opportunity again. <laughs> As Mario said, I'm Jimena. I am from Guatemala City, and I am very much interested in internal med. Amazing, Jimena. So nice to see you here. I was lurking in the background, and I feel like I got to know you when you were presenting um, two weeks ago, I believe. A very interesting toxidrome case that I will not uh, say more about uh, in case people haven't watched it and uh, really, really delighted that you're back here for more. Uh, I also wanted to congratulate you, Mario. You're done with step two. Congratulations. How does it feel? Thanks. It, it feels great. It went, it went really smoothly. I didn't feel the, the fatigue I was expecting to have, so that, that was great. So now I'm post step two life, but I have to take step one on, on Tuesday. So a uh, quick turn back. Yeah, you're, you know, that's quite a turnaround. My gosh. Oy, oy, oy. Well, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you get to bask in the fun part of medicine before you dive back deep into um, into that space. You know, it's kind of crazy. I, I just, I, I have to pinch myself every time because the truth is we have a case presenter for Guatemala, Mario's in Peru, and I'm sitting in um, in uh, San Francisco. Deborah's doing the teaching points and she just came back from the US, back to where she is now in Argentina. Um, and there are so many other uh, CP Solvers team members in the Dominican Republic and Brazil and Austria in their car in Texas and Spain. Um, it's kind of crazy in Saudi Arabia. But I also see a couple of uh, uh, a couple of a few people who haven't who've turned their videos on, uh, including our beloved Hans uh, Francisco, who has joined us a few times now. Hello, Francisco. I see Artem is here. Artem, I don't know if the I don't know if the VMR crowd knows you. Um, as well as they should. Do you want to do a quick, say a quick hello? Hey, hi everyone. Yeah, I'm Artem. I'm actually currently a fellow, rheumatology fellow at Loma Linda. And I, my patient rescheduled, I mean, my eight o'clock patient is not here. So I have time to <laughs> join you guys. Amazing. Yeah, I know of your uh, uh, presence from Twitter and I recognize your name from that space. It's really, really nice yeah. to be here. Thank you for turning your my video. Pleasure. I see somebody else with their video on, and I'm sorry, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, but it's spelled in Kecheri. Is that right? It's in Kecheniyer. In Kecheniyer. Nice to meet you. Where are you joining us from? Um, Texas. Amazing. Whereabouts in Texas? Where, where? Where, uh, whereabouts in Texas? Oh, in like Corpus Christi. Oh, I see. I see that Austin is nodding his... Uh, is it Austin? Do you, are you close by or? Uh, San Antonio is not a couple hours from Corpus, not too far. Amazing, amazing. That's cool. You guys are in closer proximity than you realize. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us. It's a delight to see you here and turning your video on. Thank you. Uh, all right. I can, I can delay it no further for the people who join at two or three minutes late, like I do to every other VMR. Um, I think we're ready to rock and roll. Uh, Jimena, whenever you're ready, we'll jump right in. Okay, thank you guys. Today um, we have, uh, sorry, here. Today we have a 74 year old male patient uh, that consulted to the ER because of a sudden syncopal episode. Do you want me to keep going? <laughs> I, I think you okay? muted. Is it okay if we discuss here, Robbie? Okay, so syncope, um, I think as we have uh, learned from Ravi, sometimes some syndromes, you have to step one, uh, one step back. Uh, and I would, I would frame this as a transient uh, loss of consciousness, which includes syncope as a potential cause, but we, we should also think of other causes like hypoglycemia, so sugar, we mentioned syncope, uh, a stroke, as in a, like a, a strategic stroke uh, or a transient ischemic attack, and uh, a, a seizure episode. So that's important to 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 be to have always present uh, because you, you you could go through a different uh, pathway and 
and end up uh, in, the, in the wrong uh, site. But if we if we take this in face value uh, face value as a syncopal episode, um, syncope can be caused by very different causes, all of them result in cerebral transitory reversible hypoperfusion. So you can have that from uh, from a, like like a like a cardio pulmonary cause. You can have severe aortic stenosis or other causes of outflow obstruction. You can have arrhythmias giving you a, an episode of cere cerebral hyperperfusion. And less commonly, um, acute coronary syndromes could, can cause and pulmonary embolism. But as I mentioned, it's not it's not a typical uh, presentation, but it would definitely be a non uh, 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 like a uh, non miss diagnosis. And besides cardiogenic, you can have uh, hyper, like orthostasis. You can have that from hypovolemia or from um, like uh, vascular insufficiency from meds like anti cholinergics, sorry, um, like alpha 1 blockers, common in elderly patients, which is the case with our patient, or from um, autonomic insufficiency from diabetes mellitus or. Uh, uh, or uh, some neuro de neurodegenerative causes like multiple system atrophy or Parkinson's. They can also present with uh, um, um, orthostatic hypo hypotension. Um, and the third one uh, is like the uh, reflex syncope, which you sh we usually think of, va of vasovagal syncope. So, um, so for some reason, you have an increased parasympathetic tone. Uh, usually, it's from, for example, I have I've had a couple of uh, basal vagal syncopes uh, during rounds. Usually, in the context of prolonged standing and uh, and in, like uh, se severe heat, so it's had a, a couple of episodes in the in the world. Uh, but that's like a, a, the most benign cause. But you can also have um, situational syncopes. Uh, or vaso, uh, sorry, carotid uh, sinus uh, hypersensitivity, which also would be in the differential. So I think we have a very broad differential at this point. And yeah, that's what I have. That's amazing. I think the most admirable part of that is that you're still going to internal medicine despite the high risk of uh, future <laughs> subsequent events <laughs> into your life. I, I love that, Mario, and I think it's really, really cool that you have such a comprehensive approach to syncope, um, including the first and most important thing, which is to realize that we never really diagnose syncope until we have an answer for why the patient syncopized. Um, it's always a working diagnosis until you find the culprit, in which case, in retrospect, it makes sense. So you can have a presumed diagnosis of syncope, but only when you find the aortic stenosis or the hypovolemia or the arrhythmia are you confident. And until you find a reason as to why the patient syncopized, you will either render a less specific diagnosis like vasovagal, or you will be always weary of the idea that something can sneak up on you like a seizure or like hypoglycemia. But I, I, I'd say I have a, one thing for you that I'm really curious. I, you have now demonstrated to all of us that you have a comprehensive lay of the land. The question for you is, what thoughts would authentically cross your mind with just this information. Meaning there's no way you're gonna think all of that before your patient tells you more information. So what will cross your mind in the split second between this information and the next aliquot? Yeah, I think I think the, the most morbid conditions would be, uh, I would only think about those until I rule them out. And, uh, yeah. less, and the benign causes can wait for later. So an arrhythmia, an ACS, Mm -hmm. Um, I think that yeah, that that really or 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 severe hypovolemia. Maybe the patient is has a GI bleed and thing and yeah. So I think probably those three like uh, like hypovolemia and ACS and maybe a PE or an arrhythmia. I think and 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 so let's 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 take those four and use the the information we have. So older age. So I would I would think it's a risk factor for cardiopulmonary disease. We don't know what other, what other risk factors it has, but I think age is one of them, one of, one of the important ones. And the sudden nature, I think it's also uh, it would trigger, at least for me, an increased probability of of, of a cardiopulmonary cause, and more specifically, an arrhythmia. Mm -hmm. um, 
So yeah, it doesn't mean that the other causes are are are, are dis, dis, discarded, but that's what triggers in my differential. Amazing, absolutely amazing. I think your comment is so wise, and pairs very well with a comment comment my new friend from Germany, Elena, just made in the chat. Um, let me uh, try to step back and explain the general principle here. When somebody has an episode of something. I kind of have to pay attention to my hands because I don't have a whiteboard. Something, they're here, normal. Something bad happens to them. And because it's an episode, they also get somewhat better. Otherwise, we wouldn't call it an episode. We would call it ongoing symptoms. The patient comes in here for a coma, or a patient comes in for hypotension, or a patient comes in for a chest pain. So the fact that the word episode is rendered means that this happened, and then something happened to on the pathway of recovery. The single most valuable piece of information is studying not just what all of our minds gravitate towards, which is what caused this and describe this, tell me about this, how did you feel, did you fall, all the events going from here to here. That gets a lot of our attention. But I will tell you, equally valuable is studying this. What did you recover to? Now, here's the problem. The data, if we had the data, the flawless data of what happened from normal to bottom, if we see that because the patient experiences their episodic syndrome in the hospital with an EEG or with an EKG or with a blood pressure monitor, that data is monumental. You don't even need the recovery because you can monitor the patient while it happens. But most of the time, these events happen outside the hospital. So while close study of the event that causes the problem is the most diagnostically specific, in real life, it is often characterized by deficient data owing to the circumstances that these episodes often happen in outside a monitor situation. As a result, analysis of the recovery phase, which is happening before your eyes, even though is less specific to the event, is characterized by high quality, accurate data. So if his heart rate is 145 now, if he is still confused now, if he is still having chest pain now, is so powerfully informative, equally so than studying the event itself, but better because it is characterized by data that you can lock into as opposed to flawed data that happened in the past that relies on memory that may be confounded by anxiety, confounded by concussion and many things. So for me, what am I doing in real life? I'm trying to understand the fingerprint of the disease right now and then try to hear the story in more detail. And that's what I'd be curious, scanning him. How does he appear right now? What are his vital signs right now? What is exam right now? And then after that, asking him, oh, okay, what happened to you? That's how I would I honestly do it in real life. All right, Himena, tell us more, please. Um, sure. So um, the patient was brought by the EMTs after a sudden episode of loss of consciousness while grocery shopping. Uh, the patient collapsed from standing height while he was being at the self-check area of the grocery store. Everything was witnessed by his wife, and she reports that he lost consciousness for a few minutes, and after it, he was alert and oriented, though the patient reports that the next thing he remembers is waking up in the ambulance. So we have like a space there where the patient appeared to be um, oriented, but he wasn't that much. Um, and the syncope had no prodrome symptoms. He had no chest pain, no shortness of breath, no lightheadedness, no sweating or any visual disturbances. Okay, great, Mina, thank you. I think this, this eloquent is very useful. Um, so at least, at least partially, one part of Bravi's uh, uh, question, I think it's answered. So uh, he's, he returned at, uh, after, at least for me, it appears he didn't, he does, he didn't endorse like a post-ictal 
uh, state. Um, we don't. I, I'm not sure if it's uh, five minutes. Um, so he 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 will come. He remembers five minutes after the the, the episode, right? Okay, so uh, five minutes. I, I'm not sure if there's a, a actual a actual cutoff for, for like a time you you should be uh, with loss of functions is be, but I think I think five minutes would be compatible. Um, the, and, the, and the second thing is we don't have like a pre-syncopal prodrome. So if we are thinking about syncopy, there's some of the differential uh, etiology the diagnosis uh, usually present with a prodrome. For example, vasovagal syncopy usually present with with um, with, uh, sh with your 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 visual field shortens. You feel you you're di diaphoretic. And um, you feel dizzy before we don't have that, and we don't have uh, other pro prodromic symptoms for to to think of a of an acute coronary syndrome as of yet. So I think that's as far as as far as I can go with the information. Absolutely superb, Mario. I have nothing to add. Spot on. Completely agree. And, and yeah, Mario, you have a question. Yeah. What, what, because I, I'm not, I'm actually not sure. What do you, what do you think about the, the time of five minutes? Do you think that's yeah. like, I, I'm not sure if it's like a, what do you, if, if, if it was a seizure, would you expect a longer, or maybe you would expect like a, a longer period without return to his basal state, but, but as, as this short time, I'm not sure what do you think about the, this post event time? Yeah, I think the, 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 this is exactly the kind of example. I'm so glad you asked this question of how it shows you how flawed analysis of this part is because the five minutes is highly subjective and very hard to interpret, honestly. So I remember when my mom had a vasovagal episode in our house out of the blue. Um, she was probably out, honestly, for 30 seconds. But in the moment, if somebody had asked me how long she was out for, I would have said 15 minutes. It's so anxiety provoking and so terrifying. And only when you are later realize that she has a benign cause, do you like, oh, you know, it wasn't that long. So interpretation of time here, even by bystanders is very, very tricky. Even by experts is very tricky. When you go into a code, you think it's lasting much longer than it actually is. So um, that's tough. So the error, the, the data that you are getting now is going to be much less accurate than the data that you're going to get in the future. Um, which is watching him now, if he has an asymmetric neuro exam, so on and so forth. But if we truly believe that somebody was out for five minutes, it's happening in the hospital, then I think there's two possibilities. Then I'll just tell you quite simply, if somebody's out for five minutes, they have a brain problem, period, period. Now, the question is, what is the brain problem? And there's two possibilities. They have a seizure or they had syncope with a concussion and head trauma. And the most benign consequence could be a concussion, but some serious things include subdural hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage. So the longer that somebody has loss of consciousness, the higher the probability of a prime of a true intrinsic brain problem, rather than a brain problem that's transiently induced by a loss of perfusion to the brain. What is the nature of that brain problem? It could be that the brain is the entire story and the patient had a seizure, or it could be that the brain problem is now a consequence of a previously transitory issue from head trauma as a result of syncope, either concussion or more ominously a CT positive consequence of trauma like an intraparenchymal subdural or subarachnoid hemorrhage. But this data highly subject to inaccuracy. You don't know how accurate it is in this patient, but for a hundred patients who present like this, the accuracy is too hard for you us to lean in on it as a reliable variable. Really good question. Thank you for asking. All right, Jimena, tell us more, please. So this patient has a history of type two diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and hypertension. The medications that he's taking are Losartan, 100 milligrams, atorvastatine, 20 milligrams, uh, Levamir, uh, 35 units, and Humalog, 5 units with meals. He um, has no history of smoking or drinking alcohol, and he doesn't report any family surgical or allergic uh, past medical history. Maybe just thank you, Jimena, for the eloquent. I think 
So I because of his insulin dependent diabetes, I would I would assume he's had diabetes for for a, for a, for a while, at least I know five years. Probably. Uh, do we do we have that data, Jimena? For just do you know how long he had he has diabetes? Yes, he do. He has had diabetes for uh, around twenty five years. Okay, that's that's a long. So he's got plenty of time to have microvascular as well as macrovascular complications. Um, so as, as we mentioned, like autonomic, autonomic uh, failure could present as, as a thing to be. Um, so that will be something to, to keep an eye on. And um, in terms of his, of his hypertension meds, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't associate those with like high, orthostatic hypotension. I think usually more the like the alpha blockers or the or the non on the or the, the hydrocreatine uh, calcium calcium channel blockers. So that's that's something also that's to my mind. I love it, Mario. It's incredible what this medical history does, and the connection with diabetes and the current syndrome is so extensive. You could have a stroke causing a seizure. You could have autonomic dysfunction. You could have hypoglycemia, and you could have hypovolemia from the hyperglycemia. So basically, what does diabetes mm -hmm. do? It just complicates things. It increases the probability of so many different things that all you really know is now the distance between you and the most common diagnosis of vasovagal syncope has just increased dramatically. That's the only thing that's happened. Cardiac causes are on the hook now. Brain causes are on the hook now. Volume causes are on the hook now. And autonomic causes are on the hook now. So practically speaking, what does diabetes do to this calculus? It increases everything except vasovagal, which is the most common diagnosis for syncope in all comers, regardless of age. So what has happened now? Vasovagal went from stop number three or four to I'm not going to diagnose vasovagal after a long, thorough workup in a patient with diabetes. And I may, I might add, maybe this patient, this could be also an, maybe an episode of hypoglycemia. Yes. Um, and this is not a syncope at all. So, absolutely. 25 years of diabetes, you probably have like the, the, the uh, um, sympathetic response, probably. Superb. Uh, Downgraded. Down so, yeah. Yeah, you're keeping us on the edge of our seats. What does the exam look like? <laughs> So the vitals were uh, 140 over 71 for the BP, pulse 59, uh, respirations 14, saturating 99, uh, with a temperature of 36.6 uh, Celsius and 98 or 98 Fahrenheit. Um, the appearance, he had a normal appearance. He had an occipital laceration uh, that um, from the fall uh, with eyes. It was uh, unremarkable. Uh, the pupils were equal, round, and reactive to light. On um, the cardio cardiovascular, he had a normal uh, a, a rhythm and rate with no murmurs. Uh, pulmonary, abdominal, and the skin was unremarkable. In neurological, he didn't have any focal deficit present, and he was alert and oriented to person, place, and time. Perfect. Thank you, Mina. So, as Ronnie mentioned, um, in uh, in the first dialogue, what uh, this syndrome appears to have a, like an episodic nature. So, this could very much be just we're catching it not in the in the in the symptomatic phase, and that's, that doesn't mean he would he, he didn't we wouldn't have any clinical manifestations. The 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 things that really are done very in our differential or like structural heart abnormalities, at least outflow tract disorders like uh, severe aortic stenosis, we probably would see some hear something or see something in the in the, in the physical exam. But in terms of, of the other cardiopulmonary causes, um, we didn't mention it, but like severe pulmonary hypertension, you could you can you can also get like uh, like the same phenomenon as a, as a as a PE, but we would we would see something in the history and we would typically see like a like a mark a, a P2 on the mitral uh, uh, side of auscultation. So that's probably less probable too. Um, he has like an isolated systolic hypertension that's, for, that's compatible with, with his history of, of longstanding hypertension. And um, I, I don't know if 
is there is there something else I can uh, dig out of this? Oh, look, look. Um, what do what do you make about the heart rate, Robbie? Does that make you think about some? I don't know because we we talk about arrhythmias, but there are not only tachy arrhythmias; it could be brady arrhythmias too. Um, and if you if you add a long-standing history of of, of diabetes, mm -hmm. that would that would uh, make more probable like a a, a brady arrhythmia. So, yeah. I think this heart rate is so symbolic of this entire case presentation. It's so just right there, keeping us on the edge of our seats and keeping us very, very engaged. I love it. I think this is, uh, you know, I think what you're doing here is actually very special because um, if this were, if this were a case that you were presenting on rounds or that you're having a discussion, you would have presented all this data quickly. You know, 74 year old diabetes had a syncopal episode in the, in the, in the grocery store fell passed out here are vitals. The fact that you're choosing to present it so slowly is really allowing us to study just how much progress we can make with such little information. I'm really curious, actually, before I reflect on Mario's question, like what, how did you decide to break it up this way? Cause it's very uh, smart and uh, creating such a rich, rich uh, um, learning for me. And I hope everybody else, how did you decide to do that? Um, honestly, I decided presented how I thought that it was kind of like more logical knowing yeah. the presentation with the final diagnosis. I love it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it requires a lot of, a lot of practice, a lot of hard work and a lot of medical knowledge. And, um, uh, I saw from, uh, from the chat that you were working with, uh, folks in the case review committee with Yaz and Hu Tang, huh? Which is, um, which is wonderful. I'm so glad to hear that. Um, yeah. This is very, very intriguing, Mario, because it, it goes to show you the power of the problem representation. And here would be my problem representation. A seven-year-old man with transient loss of consciousness without a trace. Now, what do I mean by that? It's a little bit of a leap to say that. But as you said, if we go back well, actually, let's just make the assumption that this person syncopized for teaching purposes and clarity. If this person is syncopized, they either have cardiogenic, hypovolemic, uh, um, orthostatic, or vasovagal. Now, which of those four causes syncope without any persistent signal of the cause of syncope upon evaluation? Hypovolemia is not going to fix itself spontaneously. Autonomic dysfunction is not going to fix itself spontaneously. Vasovagal syncope does fix itself spontaneously. Can cardiac causes fix themselves spontaneously? Some of them, exactly half of them, actually. What are those half? There's two kinds of cardiac causes of syncope. Mechanical obstruction, like aortic stenosis, pulmonary embolism, uh, outflow tract obstruction, pericardial effusion, those cannot fix themselves spontaneously. And the patient will always have a fingerprint of their presence on arrival. Some of them though can be subtle, like, uh, like outflow tract obstruction or pul pulmonary embolism, which can be sneaky. But what is the cardiac cause that can cause devastation and then vanish? Arrhythmia. Presumed syncope without a trace is often the result of a sudden discharge of electrical activity, which then vanishes and recedes only to come back again in the future. What could that electrical activity be as benign as a discharge from the vagal nerve or as sinister as an atrial or ventricular arrhythmia? By far and away, the most common cause. If Jimena had told us that this was presumed syncope with tachycardia, with a murmur, with orthostasis, with GI bleeding, with diarrhea, this is syncope without a trace, which means electricity gone. In most people, that electricity is vasovagal. In somebody who fell so hard that they could not brace themselves to protect themselves from a fall to cut their occipital lobe, uh, occipital skull open, that's arrhythmia until proven otherwise. So 
I'm going to look at this EKG up, down, left, right, and center to study not the likely cause, but to see if there's a clue that this arrhythmia was kind enough to leave a prolonged PR interval, a prolonged QTC, a wide QRS. The EKG here is the money shot. Why? Because this is syncope without a trace, which is a very, very, very important representation of this problem. But it's a leap of faith because you could argue, Mario, that a heart rate of 59 is a trace or that you could say that the occipital laceration may be enough to actually pivot away from syncope and say, did this person have a seizure? So there are flaws in this problem representation, but it is 90% accurate in my opinion and um, really helps us make progress to really scrutinize the EKG. So what do I do in real life? Syncope with a trace or syncope without? And <clears throat> while we wait for the EKG, there's going to be one key step we do, which is we now know the patient was here in the shopping, mar shopping uh, in the grocery store, fell, got up and recovered or alert oriented everything. But what don't we know? We don't know what he's like before the grocery store. If you now hear that he has palpitations or has reduction in exercise tolerance, or actually, even if you hear he has unilateral numbness and tingling in an episodic manner, all those are going to be powerful clues. Has he seized before? Has he had presyncope before? Has he had palpitations before? I don't think this story began in the grocery store. Most of the time, there are clues that are hidden in the past. So EKG, and let's chat about what happened before the grocery store. I think both of those would be very, very important. Any questions about that, Mario? I just hope Jimena doesn't present us an EKG because I'm gonna sink up. I, I don't know, I'm gonna have another sink of me. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it won't be your first time either. <laughs> I I um I do have some bad news for you, and because I do have the EKG. <laughs> Um, should I make you a co-host? Are you planning on sharing the image or just the report? You know, what's your plan? Uh, no, I am planning on sharing the image. Um, okay. Let me okay. uh, make you co-host. Where is my, oh my gosh, I can't find my, oh, it's in this. Sorry, I have a couple of windows open. So let me make you, okay, you should be good to go in about 10 seconds. Okay, all right, there you are. Um... Yeah, I think I'm going to stop the sharing of the yes, person okay. with the board. No problem. There it is. All right, Mario. Good luck to you, buddy. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> yeah, I'm going to need it. So I usually start by looking at the rhythm, and I look at the uh, the uh, at the limb leads from D from D one to AVF, and they all should you, you should you, we should have P waves before the QRSs in all of them, positive P waves and a negative P wave in AVR. So we, we see that in D1, D2, and a little bit in AVL. So we have a, a, we have a sinus rhythm. Um, and uh, to confirm a sinus rhythm, we should have a regular QRSs, which we do have. So I, I would say that we have at least like, like the, 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 there's a rhythm coming from the sinus node. So, uh, afterwards, I usually check the pre, uh, like the heart rate. Is it one three hundred, one fifty, seventy five? So yeah, it's around sixty. Yeah, around fifty six. So we we have uh, like a normal cardia or a slight bradycardia. Um, what I do next is uh, uh, to see the the QRS, and the first thing is to 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 check if it's a, a wide or a narrow a narrow QRS, and I believe we have a white QRS, um, which is yeah, it's not not just in all the on the all the leads, um, and uh, especially in the the pre the, the pre-quarter leads. Um, after that, uh, I check to see if there's like a, if there's a bundle bundle branch uh, block morphology or or, hy or hy hypertrophy. I usually um, we, we um, for Right bundle, right bundle uh, branch block. We should have a positive QRS in V1 and a and a negative in V6, which is the, the inverse of that. Uh, so, um, uh, in 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 less bundle uh, bundle branch block, we should have uh, 
this morphology, but and maybe someone can correct me. I haven't checked the criteria for a while, but we we should have uh, there shouldn't be a white GRS and there shouldn't be uh, Q waves in D two and D three and AVF, which we have. So I think it's this is not left under bank block. After that, I check the ST and T segments to see if there's any ST elevations. And I think it's, at least for me, it's pretty clear we have, a, a, I think it's a le at least two millimeters in V1, uh, not that much in V2, V3, uh, and maybe a little bit V4. Uh, after that, I usually check the, the, the QT. It should be less than a half of the RR, which it is, so no QT prolongation. So um, I just noticed that it's also written in the, in the automatic uh, interpretation. So uh, at, at, at least for at this, it says left on the branch block. I'm not sure about the, the criteria, so we'll check that. But I do see ST elevations in in V1 to V4, that can be from ACS or just like the, the part of the pattern from uh, left bundle branch block. We should have, that's when we, oh, this is a tricky one. <laughs> we have to check the Scarbosa criteria, which you, should, you, you, I think if I remember correctly, you have to see if there's, uh, so every ST elevation in all the leads should be, uh, on the opposite direction of the QRS. If you have it in the same direction, that usually that that usually is ACS. So let's see. In, in some, if we see V1, it's in the opposite direction. That's good. V2, V3, uh, V4 also. In V5, it's kind of odd. And uh, in V6, we don't see that. We we see like a. I think that's a secondary a secondary reparation of method. So. At least in my humble interpretation, this would be compatible with the Garbosa criteria for no ACS. But I'm not that confident in my interpretation, to be honest. Yeah, I think, um, you, yeah. I think you should adjust your confidence. That's a superb read. Yeah, this, this patient has sinus rhythm with left bundle branch block without uh, meeting Scarbosa's criteria. Completely agree with you. And I think the interesting thing is to comment on the access because it's positive in AVR and negative in one and negative in two, which suggests as the... As the uh, as the computer says, right superior access deviation, which is pretty tricky. It might be because of lead plate placement issues. I don't understand that space too much, but it's unusual for somebody to have a left bundle branch block without having a positive, uh, um, uh, predominantly positive deflection in one. So that's a little bit unusual. But at the end of the day, all you can say is this person has a left bundle branch block, which um, historically was in the criteria for... Um, for consideration of MI if new, but actually in, in either soon to be published or recent guidelines, given just the sheer frequency of a left bundle branch block in the population, um, cardiologists are moving a little bit away from using this as a criteria for MI if, if it's new, especially in patients who present with chest pain and not uh, present with syncope and not with chest pain. So this tells us this person's heart is abnormal, further reinforcing the notion that this person probably had syncope and then tells us that they have conduction system disease. Their left bundle is completely down. I'm not sure what the axis signifies. And so um, what could be compatible with this, Mario, is you could have um, uh, um, high vagal tone causing AV block on top of a left bundle. That's not a healthy picture. Or you could have structural heart disease. I'd be curious to look at the leads myself to see if the axis deviation is a lead placement issue or should make us think about things that cause um, right axis deviation. Um, but for the sake of time, I'll give the mic back to you, Jimena. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to stop sharing for uh, the person with the board to share it. Okay, so um, the CVC was normal. The chemistry was normal too. The patient got on chest x-ray, which reported to be normal too. Um, he also got a head CT because of the occipital laceration. That was normal. And because of the uh, left bundle branch, he got a TTE. And that revealed an LVEF of 20 to 25%, septal and apical severe hypokinesis, um, LV diastolic dysfunction, uh, grade one, and concentric LVH.
Wow, that's that's impressive. Um, I would have I, don't, I would have expected to see some of the TTE findings reflected on the on the on the EK on the on the EKG as I don't know as, as like more pronounced Q waves maybe in the septal and apical leaf, but uh, maybe that's obscured from the left bundle by, left uh, bundle uh, branch block morphology. Um, so uh, let's see. So I think we're deep in cardi cardi in cardiogenic uh, uh, syncope right now. We have evidence in the EKG and on the TTE. Um, what the TTE tells us is at, at least there's a component of 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 not out, out, outflow obstruction, but uh, like low cardiac output that will also be at, uh, I, I don't know if it's like, if we could uh, say it's the only responsible cause of his syncope, but at, at least it's definitely a, a component. Um, um, so in terms of the diastolic dysfunction, that's common in hypertensive patients, in, in like in, in chronic hypertension. Um, and also the concentric left ventricular hypertrophy is, is, is compatible with like increased uh, after um uh, uh, what do you say in english um in spanish is called post -carga. like there's more pressure to 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 the, for a left ventricle to to eject the, the blood volume but the septum and apical hypokinesis uh, that's uh, in my mind when you when you have um like um Asymmetric or focal hypokinesis that's usually uh, co that's commonly seen in in post uh, ischemic uh, myocardial area. So and like an an old um I would I would say it would be compatible with an old MI. I'm not sure, uh, and not an acute because of the EKG. Maybe that's a big mistake I'm making. Maybe maybe I shouldn't. Maybe we shouldn't. Discharge and, 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 and ACS because of the normal EKG and the septum and epilog hypogonesis. I'm not sure about that. I would like to see maybe some uh, troponins. But I, I guess what I'm, what I'm saying is um, we have evidence of a cardiac, like a structural cardiac issue, uh, and also probably an, an, like, an, like a, an, a, a, a bradyrhythmic component to this. So, um, that's what, that's what I'm at. I hope you're seeing what you're doing to the whiteboard, Maria. They're having to create much more room for the teaching points because of the amount of wisdom you're sharing. I feel bad. I feel bad. For Literally, the whiteboard is moving <laughs> to the right. Um, yeah, I think to summarize, you started off with a patient with syncope. We don't know how he was feeling before that, but I think given the echo findings, which we haven't proven are old, but um, given the LVH and the diastolic dysfunction and just the severity of the EF without a parallel severe hemodynamic syndrome, it's fair to assume that this person has had longstanding symptoms and has compensated for them. And so uh, the questions about how they were feeling before the grocery store will probably be productive if they're done precisely to adjust for normal human compensatory mechanisms to chronic disease and human propensity for reduction of symptoms to uh, replace that with health, as I'm doing with my teeth right now, which currently hurt, but I'm pretending they're fine. Uh, because I don't want to go to a dentist. But anyway, that's another whole other story. Um, so now you basically have had a single event in a patient with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So what is the most common cause of HEFREF? It's coronary artery disease. And is that a plausible diagnosis in a 74-year-old patient with diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia? Oh my gosh, yes, the probability is through the roof. So... Um, how can patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction present with cardiogenic syncope? And that there are two possibilities. One is that they had intermittent ventricular arrhythmias, which is very, very scary, and a decent risk for when their EF is less than 35%, or that they have progressive conduction system disease from fibrosis of the conduction system causing either sinus node dysfunction or um, AV node dysfunction. So these are very, very tricky situations because um, in order to know what the diagnosis is, you need to have prolonged rhythm monitoring because presumably this patient isn't having syncope every day or every other day. So the way these are handled are, is very, very tricky and complicated because 
if the patient is having sinus node dysfunction or AV node dysfunction, they need a pacemaker. If the patient's having ventricular arrhythmias, they need an ICD implantable cardio, uh, cardiac defibrillator. So the, the, new, the management of these patients is very complicated and very nuanced, but I would just say that uh, primary prevention of ventricular arrhythmias through an AICD is only done for patients with persistent heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, despite optimal goal-directed medical therapy. And this patient is not there yet. So if he does receive any therapy, device therapy for an arrhythmia, either bradyarrhythmia from sinus or AV node disease or ventricular arrhythmia, it would have to be for secondary prevention after diagnostic clarity on this event was obtained, either a bradyarrhythmia or a ventricular arrhythmia. And how do we do that? There's a whole variety of cardiac monitors, beginning with telemetry in the hospital to xio patches for two weeks to invasive cardiac monitors. And so these are complex nuanced decisions that factor in patient preference and healthcare resources. All right, Jimena, yes. tell Yeah, oh, sorry, Mario, go for it. Sorry, Jimena, I just wanted to add something. I want, I want to show maybe like a bias as well. So for me, an, like an acute decompensated heart failure patient has a, like it's not one symptom, but you usually present with a multiple symptoms that make you think of, of, of heart failure. So this on uh, like progressive dyspnea or thalpnea, lower extremity edema, uh, crackles on, on chest on pulmonary auscultation. I haven't seen, I have never seen a, like an, an acute decompensated heart failure presenting or 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 or, or a, like a, a initial presentation of a heart failure presenting with with a with an with a, a syncopal episode without other manifestations at least clinically because we have we have the uh, echocardiographic uh, manif evidence of heart failure but I don't see other clinical manifestations so that's that's a learning point for me uh, that you can present like with isolated symptoms and not with the whole picture. I think that's a very astute pickup, Mario. Honestly, just to say that 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 um, th this is this is not unusual because of how common heart failure is. It's so common that atypical presentations like this are not unheard of. Um, and I I really would suspect that uh, many of these patients who have this finding are in the phase of heart failure where they have reduction in cardiac output. So the vast majority of times where I've been in this, where a, a close interview with the patient reveals a gradual reduction in their exercise tolerance for months to years. But this is a reminder that heart failure progresses through two phases. First, the phase of reduction in cardiac output without passive congestion, where patients just don't exert themselves as much. Only after the cardiac output has declined to such a high degree, less than 50% of capacity, do patients then develop a traffic jam so bad that it clogs up their veins. But the initial phases of heart failure are like mild traffic, where things are still flowing, but it's taking much longer and the patient feels it, but the traffic isn't stuck. So this presentation is very much in line with those patients. And I would say there's a high chance that this patient has had a, comp a marked reduction in his exercise capacity, whether or not that is vocalized immediately or whether or not that requires close interviewing to, to, to disentangle the compensatory mechanisms that he is engaged in. All right, Himena, tell us more, please. I, I just wanna say that this discussion is so amazing and that you were right on point. Um, Ravi, because the story with this patient is that he recently had retired and one of the of uh, his daughters had moved into the house with them. So he went from working to no working at all. So he never, um, it was like the perfect combination for him not to notice that his physical activity was declining um, because he had more help in the house and he wasn't working anymore. Um, another reason for that is that um, he did have uh, a cardiologist, but he didn't follow with that cardiologist. He was uh, non-compliant with the medication. And that's something that we got from the family, not from him. 
Um, and the family didn't understand very well, but the past cardiologist uh, had told them that he had some electrical problems in his heart. Um, so this is this is a person who had a long history of cardiac issues that weren't managed uh, very properly. And that's why it seems like this presentation is like very sudden and he didn't have any symptoms before. But as Ravi said, the, the symptoms were there in the history. It's just that nobody figured it out and puzzled um, until we just started asking for more information. Yeah, I think this is has to be like one of my favorite cases on VMR because it's one of the rare instances where you're presenting pure real life cases that um, um, Gurpreet Dhaliwal, really our idol in clinical reasoning, uh, was on a podcast and he said, all too often these simulated cases are sanitized, meaning that the history and the exam are just given perfectly to the discussants so they can come up with the answer. But all of medicine in real life is complicated and inaccurate and unsanitized. You don't know what's signal, what's noise. You don't know if you have all the data. You don't trust that everything's just going to be handed to you like it often is on VMR. And twice now you've presented us two cases that make us feel like we're there with the person where we don't know if we're missing something or we don't know if there's a piece of data that uh, that, has, uh, that will crack the case for us. So I uh, I really, really love this. I have a couple of fun questions just to be able to learn more from this, but I would love to pass the mic to Mario to see where his head is at, what questions you have, Mario, were. Um, are there any things open for you that you're not sure about or um, tell us where you're at? Well, I just want to thank Mina again. I think she did all the hard part. Like the, inf the information acquisition is way harder than being discussing with the information that she's presented to us. So yeah, kudos to Mina for for taking great uh, great care of the patient and being able to, to acquire all the information. Um, uh, uh, in terms of uh, like uh, cognitive, is it called auto autopsy, right? Cognitive autopsy. <laughs> um, I think um, for starters, I didn't consider, I didn't have heart failure in a part of my differential from syncope. I think I had syncope as a manifestation of heart failure, but I didn't, not, not heart failure, not syncope as a, like an like a isolated manifestation manifestation of heart failure. So I think that's a a good uh, teaching point for me. Um, um, I would definitely look into uh, other common diseases that can present with with isolated symptoms like like this. I think that's that's a big uh, teaching point. And and uh, lastly, um, this is like a. a a common disease that thankfully now has a good guideline directed medical therapies. Um, this patient should be like on the quadruple therapy. And one, like on maybe on, on management wise, what you mentioned, Ravi, it would be interesting to see uh, if this patient did have like, uh, like an, an, an arrhythmia indication for a pacemaker, would he, because of his heart failure, although he isn't on the uh, optimal GDMT would would the cardiologist still put put an ICD because ICD has like pacemaker and defibrillator activity in that's a, like a, like management management right a good question so yeah full summary I love your advice yeah, yeah. Uh, completely agree I think that's the key question and and many patients many patients would get uh, an ICD for for this instance for the idea that they might need in the future. I'm curious, Amanda, what, what ended up happening with your patient? Is this ongoing now or, or did uh, any therapies get instituted? Um, well, yes, with the follow-up of the patient, definitely he went on telemetry because there was a concern for a ventricular arrhythmia that wasn't registered and that was the cause of the syncopal episode. Um, he was also programmed to have an angiogram in the outpatient clinic for evaluation of uh, uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy. Um, all of the other tests for non-ischemic cardiomyopathy were considered after the angiogram, because as you said before, like this patient has really, really big risk factors and the possibility of being ischemic is really high. Um, I saw some comments with the echo and I think that Mar Mario mentioned it. Um, 
with the focal hypokinesis. So yeah, that, that was also given an idea that this patient might have had like some ACS that wasn't very um, clinically evident. So they never consulted and that's where the focal uh, hypokinesis is coming from. So everything with him was pointing to an ischemic um, problem. And um, you also mentioned it too. He was also programmed to get a defibrillator. He had a class one indication for a defibrillator because he had a, a, an arrhythmia with a, a prolonged QRS and he has a very low EF. Um, and that's the workup that the patient's going through now. So educational. Um, I really, really thank you for presenting this case. And um, I think it's just so perfect um, to get a condition that truly is a common thing that you'll face, syncope and heart failure. And you showed us and proved to us that these cases, our bread and butter, are so incredibly educational. And I hope that um, people listening will be inspired to follow a path like you to present cases like this all the time. Um, and I'll emphasize that the case review committee is another place that um, you can go to to really, really um, uh, have folks like um, Yaz and Hugh Ting help you uh, put this case together. So thank you so much, Iman. I learned so, so much from this. And um, I secretly hope that uh, you will have round three, four, and five uh, to learn. <laughs> I, really um, I, I think that's very possible. <laughs> fingers crossed. Well, uh, Mario, amazing job. I thought your conversation and your discussion was superb. We'll chat more offline about it. Uh, thank you to Marina for scribing. And I'll pass the mic uh, to Deborah for teaching points. Deborah, I made you host because I have to go to work. So I'll miss your teaching points, but I'll definitely check them out on uh, on YouTube. Just don't forget to close the meeting when you're done so that we don't uh, listen into your room for hours later. Thanks, everyone. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Jimena, for the discussion. And thank you, Mario and Robbie. It was amazing. Going for some teaching points like the the chief complaint of syncope was think about the loss of consciousness that could be a hypoglycemia, a stroke or a seizure. And then Mario went for a great differential diagnosis like that could be something in, in the CNS like a cerebral transitory hyperperfusion, Parkinson or cardiopulmonary cause like severe stenosis, acute coronary syndrome, or aortic dissection or an arrhythmia or something orthostatic, orthostatic or a hypovolemia, anticholinergic drug, a diabetes, or a vasovagal reflex. And the management of this patient, we have to first check the vitals and then go for the history and check the HPI and the, the past medical history. And in this case, the past medical history of diabetes can uh, increase the risk of stroke. The patient could have a seizure, a hypovolemia, or a hypoglycemia. And then Robbie put like the categories of the syncope in four, or uh, that could be a, a hypovolemia, an autonomic dysfunction, vasovega, and a cardiac. And the cardiac, we went for the mechanic that could be an stenosis, a pericardial effusion, or an arrhythmia. And we have, to, in this case, we have to show there any KG, see if there is any clue, any prolonged PR, who were asked, an elevated CT. And then we went for the cardiogenic syncope that the patient had the evidence in the EKG and the TTE. And a possible cause of this syncope could be an arrhythmia like or a progressive conduction disease like in the sin, sin, sinus node or in the AV node. And then we got the diagnosis of the heart failure that could be in phases that the patient initially cannot feel the symptoms. And then when the patient presents with less than 50%, the patient can really feel the difference um, doing like a, an exercise. So yeah. Thank you, everyone, for, for being here today. I hope to see you all tomorrow. <laughs>